Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Bob Palmer, uh, Executive Director of the Advanced Radar Research Center. And today for the uh, VPRP's webinar series, we have Dr. David Bodine. Uh, he was born in Kansas. Um, he did his, he's got an interdisciplinary past where he did his MS degree in electrical engineering uh, here at OU in 2009 and then finished his PhD in, in meteorology in 2014. Um, his areas of interest vary from uh, boundary layer meteorology to uh, an emphasis in radar, dual polarization radar signatures of supercells and tornadoes to uh, more recently numerical simulations of vortices. Uh, after he finished his PhD, he went to NCAR as an ASP uh, postdoc and worked on the pecan uh, field experiment. In 2016, we were able to lure him back to OU and he's now a research scientist in the ARC and he um, uh, leads our mobile radar fleet, the organization of it, scheduling everything, but also the science, of course. Uh, he's very active in the AMS. He's on the Committee on Radar Meteorology. He's an associate editor for both Monthly Weather Review and Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. He co-chaired the Phase Array Symposium in the last AMS meeting, and he's going to be co-chairing the 2021 AMS Conference on Radar Meteorology. Uh, so I think we're very lucky to have him give a, a webinar today, and it's a good timing since we have some storms in Norman. So David, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Bob. Yeah, we do have uh, some active weather. We've been under a severe thunderstorm morning for uh, a good chunk of the of the morning. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the tornado research that we're doing in the at the Advanced Radar Research Center. I'd like to thank a lot of several people who've contributed to this work, as well as the National Science Foundation and NOAA, uh, who provided funding for the work that we're doing. So uh, as many of you know, tornadoes uh, come in all shapes and sizes. They produce wind speeds that are highly variable. Some are relatively weak, like 40 miles an hour, all the way up to over 300 miles an hour, producing some of the strongest winds on Earth. Uh, tornadoes also have uh, some paths that are very short, but others that go for over 100 miles. And part of the mystery of tornadoes is why do you get all this variability? Uh, one of the reasons why Oklahoma has been such a focal point for severe weather research is it's a uh, area where we have the uh, most high, highest frequency, uh, among the highest frequency of tornadoes in the country, as well as uh, some of the most violent tornadoes as well. Uh, throughout in the United States, there's about a thousand tornadoes that occur each year, and they cause uh, about 80 deaths per year as well. And in many cases, uh, a single tornado can produce over a billion dollars in damage. So they're certainly catastrophic uh, events. Uh, Oklahoma is certainly no stranger to severe weather. This is, uh, uh, more Oklahoma has been struck four times by a different violent tornadoes since 1999. Uh, the May 3rd tornado is uh, one of the most famous of those. This is a photo of the May, or the May 3rd, 1999 tornado. Uh, and this is a video of the more recent uh, May 20th, uh, 2013 tornado. The May 3rd, 1999 tornado produced uh, the strongest winds on record uh, from a Doppler radar measuring wind speeds of 301 miles an hour. This is data we collected during the EF, EF5 uh, May 20th tornado uh, from the OUPX1000 radar. And you see here, this is the image of reflectivity, so it's showing the, the intensity of precipitation. Also, this is the Doppler velocity data. And where you see this, uh, the bright uh, blue colors and red colors close together is where the tornado is located. And one of the interesting things about this case is that the couple, it's not moving in a straight line. You can see it kind of oscillating around and even doing kind of a big loop toward the end there. Uh, another really extreme tornado event was on uh, May 31st, uh, 2013 near El Reno, Oklahoma. This tornado was the largest tornado uh, by diameter on record at 2.6 miles wide. The OU Raxpol radar measured wind speeds over 300 miles an hour in, in this tornado. So you can see here a picture of Raxpol uh, in the background of this large tornado, as well as uh, animation of the data that was collected by Raxpol during this event. So you can see the, the strong 
uh, strong area of rotation that develops here and then moves forward. Moves forward in time, you can see it rapidly develop and then intensify. So what are some of the things that we know about tornadoes? Maybe the most important thing is how tornadoes form. Uh, one of the most common theories of tornado formations is that there are different air masses that are generated within the thunderstorm itself. So outside of the thunderstorm, the air that's coming into it is usually warm and moist any day you've been out on it. And when there's severe weather that happens, you probably notice that. But inside the storm, there's uh, large areas of precipitation that generate rain-cooled air. And this rain-cooled air generates a, a gradient in temperature um, that can end up producing a rotation at the interface of this boundary. And this rotation is oriented about a horizontal axis instead of a vertical axis like you would have for a tornado. So for example, the rain-cooled air at this boundary will start to generate this horizontal rotation that gets drawn into the storm. And then either the updraft or the downdraft, as the air is coming in horizontally, it turns upward or downward and that can orient the rotation in a vertical manner. So depending on the, the temperature of the air, if it's really cold, it becomes really difficult to lift that air and generate a tornado. But if the air is not too cold, uh, you can get a, a strong tornado that develops. So that's what's illustrated here in the schematic. Relatively warm air is, is easily lifted and may produce a tornado. Uh, another uh, theory of tornado genesis is uh, rivers of rotating air. So it's something that is uh, recently, especially in computer simulations by one of my collaborators, Lee Orff at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he's done a lot of research uh, looking at the evolution of what's called the streamwise vorticity current. And what that is, is basically a, a large or an area of rotating, horizontally rotating air that gets drawn in into the storm's updraft and then turns upright uh, into the vertical axis. And that's seen developing prior to the tornado forming and is thought to play a role in the formation of the tornado. And many of these simulations also show uh, several vertically oriented vortices that get uh, brought in closer to the uh, storm's updraft where they might also interact and perhaps uh, contribute to tornado genesis. So what are some of the unanswered questions about tornadoes? Uh, the formation process and what the source of rotation is still not, an, not entirely well known. There are many theories that have been proposed uh, but many of these have not uh, been validated through extensive field data that have been collected, such as Doppler radar data. Uh, so it's, it's still unknown exactly how the rotation of the tornado is produced and, and what are the sources of that rotation. Also, another important question, especially for forecasting, is how do we distinguish a storm that's going to produce a tornado from one that won't produce one? And why do some uh, storms produce violent tornadoes and others produce weak tornadoes? So if you think about a tornado watch, uh, a lot of times you can see all of these different outcomes, even though that whole area is generally considered favorable for tornadoes, but some storms won't produce a tornado and others might produce a really long track, a uh, strong tornado. And then also what causes the winds in the tornado to vary along the tornado's track. So one of the, uh, two of the ways that we can improve our understanding of tornadoes, a uh, new radar technology and other observations can help us get a better idea of seeing how the storm changes leading up to tornado formation. And improved forecast models can also help us uh, better predict uh, where storms may produce a tornado and where they might not. So the radar technologies uh, played a very important role uh, uh, beginning all the way back in the 1950s and 60s when early studies acknowledged uh, that hook echoes often uh, preceded or occurred during tornado events. And those were some of the first signatures that were used to issue uh, tornado warnings. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, rotational signatures were identified from Doppler radar data, which could detect the winds and the, or detect the winds in the storm. And this was a, a lot of this work was done here at, in the city of Norman uh, by the National Severe Storms Lab. And this motivated the development of the nationwide uh, operational radar network, NEXRAD. And bringing uh, Doppler capability nationwide with 150 of these radars, uh, we've, uh, the forecasters uh, have been able to provide warnings that reduce fatalities up to 40% and save the country on average $50 million a year just for the benefit of uh, tornadoes alone. So that's not including flash floods and other things that the, the radars are very useful for. And mobile radars are, are very helpful for uh, mapping the winds in the tornado as well as the 
winds that surround or within the thunderstorm that we can better understand tornado formation by seeing how the storm changes leading up to tornado formation. So one of the key limitations of current radar technology is an X-rad radar requires five minutes to scan a storm. So radar will go around and make a scan at one height, then it will go up a little bit, scan at the next height. And similar to this image here with the different colors, it's trying to cover all of these different levels. And since the radar is physically rotating around, it takes about five minutes to do that. Uh, some tornadoes don't even last five minutes. So it's really important to be able to scan faster than five minutes, but tornado genesis may occur uh, relatively quickly. And it, it's something that we, to see how a tornado forms, we're going to need to be able to scan faster. Uh, many mobile radars also take several minutes to scan a full storm. So the Advanced Radar Research Center at o OU is developing uh, some next generation technology aimed at uh, solving some of these issues. Uh, the Advanced Radar Research Center was started at OU in 2005. It's located uh, east of the National Weather Center. So if you're familiar with Norman, that's uh, at Jenkins and Highway 9. Uh, the radar group here is uh, the largest academic radar program in the country, has 110 faculty, staff, and students. And uh, in general, our goal is to bring, we have scientists and engineers who are working together on a variety of different problems where you, we need to design a radar system, build a radar system, and then take that radar system out in the field to do research with it. Uh, and many times that's often for uh, to do projects like studying tornadoes uh, to improve scientific understanding. So I'm going to uh, turn things over to, to Bob here, who's out in our, uh, the high bay where we have our mobile radars. OK, can you see my screen? I can see you, but I, I can okay, see let me you. turn it around. Okay. How about that? Yep. OK. okay. Uh, so David, why don't you go ahead and narrate? Do you want me to go to Raxpole first? Yeah, go ahead and go to Raxpole. So Rexpol is one of our mobile radars. This, uh, the large stop, stop sharing your screen because oh, okay. I think most people are just seeing the slide. So the, the Rexpol, if you, if you looked at the top, there's this big dome. That's the radar's antenna. So that's where the radar waves get transmitted and are, are received. So that gets pointed in the direction of the storm that we want to look at. What's cool about Raxpole is that can rotate 180 degrees per second or two times or once every two seconds it can go around. I hear it's not rotating that fast. But when we multiply it for us, when we take it on storm chases, the radar is, is rotating extremely quickly. So the cool thing about that is it allows you to a scan a different level of storm every two seconds. So in about 20 seconds, we can see the entire storm. This radar is also dual polarization. So it provides additional information about precipitation and tornado tornado. And of course, maybe the most important thing is that it's on a truck. So we, can, we don't have to wait for the storm to come to us. We can uh, drive out the storm. So uh, Professor uh, Howard Bluestein at the University of Oklahoma leads a, a Springfield campaign every year to study uh, severe thunderstorms and we collaborate with him on those on that research and maintain the system. Now, uh, uh, Bob's showing you a live view of the Raxpole. It's currently uh, pointing vertically. Uh, this is looking at the Doppler velocity field. So since we're pointing up, the raindrops are falling toward us. So you see a lot of green colors where the uh, are representing motion toward the radar as these raindrops are falling toward it. But you can also see some areas of positive velocities where uh, there may be some upward motion as well. So uh, the Raxpole is one of several of our radars. Uh, we have another phased array radar called the Atmospheric Imaging Radar that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Uh, Bob's walking over to the PX10,000, which is our newest uh, dual polarization radar. This is another rapid scan radar. So this radar can rotate around once per second. So it goes 360 degrees per second. So it's uh, ridiculously fast. So this radar could do a scan 10 different heights in a storm in about 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, so we're taking a look inside the radar. So the whole radar is enclosed in this trailer. So we can tow it uh, to different locations. Uh, if you look on this dish, you can see kind of uh, two little black uh, pipes. This is where, or two little black pieces of metal on the, on the uh, antenna. And if you look at each side, they look pretty much similar to each other. And one side is where the radar generates a horizontally polarized wave that, or a wave that oscillates in a horizontal direction. And the other side is where the radar 
generates uh, vertically polarized waves. So this is also a, a dual polarization radar. So we can take information from both of those polarizations to extract more information about the shapes of raindrops or uh, tornado debris, uh, birds, insects, and so forth. So one final thing I'd, I'd like to mention about the system is uh, this radar is something we built with a private company, uh, Nanowave. It was a, or a joint effort to design the system and we have an opportunity now to use it for scientific research. So it's a really nice collaboration. Okay, I guess I'll stop now. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll switch okay. over and, and share my screen again. All right, so uh, one of our mobile radars that's uh, not shown there is the atmospheric imaging radar. Uh, this was the first weather radar to use an imaging technique for severe weather research. And uh, it was the first weather radar also that was built by the University of Oklahoma, as well as the first phased array of radar that we built. Uh, so what's unique about the system is most radars transmit a really narrow beam. So radars like the Raxpole generate a beam that's very narrow and focused in space. So that radar is only looking in a, a tiny part of the atmosphere at any given time. Whereas the air is transmitting a wide beam over a, a large, uh, over basically a column of the atmosphere. So it's uh, transmitting and then receiving data over that whole column. So one of the problems with that is, let's say you have a tornado at the ground and just kind of a slower winds above that. Uh, normally you wouldn't be able to distinguish those two because you're getting returns from the tornado and from above. But this system uh, receives data with a, a set of antennas that allow us to form multiple beams at the same time. And these multiple beams will give us data throughout the storm uh, with very fine detail from the very bottom of it all the way up to the top. So another way of thinking about this uh, here actually, uh, similar to a digital camera where we can capture data uh, where the, each of these individual antennas acts like a pixel and you have a flash or the transmit that goes throughout the whole column of the atmosphere is like a, a flash of a camera. So to illustrate uh, how this is different from an X-rad scanning, each of these green dots are a place where the radar is scanned. So you can see here the next rad radar kind of goes across the storm uh, scanning, and then it's going to go up to the next height and start scanning across. So then it does this as it goes through multiple elevation angles. This takes about five minutes to do. Whereas uh, a radar like the air, uh, collects data in an entire vertical column all at once, and then just scans one time across. So it can capture data uh, through a significant depth of, of the storm or, or the feature of interest. So this tends to be about 30 to 60 times faster than an XRAD radar. This data from the uh, May 31st, uh, 2013 El Reno supercell that we collected with the air. Uh, we were relatively far away from the storm. So we had a really nice view of the entire storm structure. Uh, you can see here some areas of uh, these red areas that are ascending really rapidly. This is in the storm's updraft. Uh, so we can see some of these areas of maybe debris or precipitation that are ascending uh, within this really intense tornado. Uh, to give you a little bit of a, an idea of what some of the mobile radar deployments look like, this is a time-lapse video uh, we took during one of the air deployments. You see here the motions of the clouds. I'm going to turn around here and you can see the pedestal of the air rotating back and forth. And then we'll zoom back around here. Uh, this is one of my students, former students, Martin Satrio. And you can see a wall cloud that's starting to develop off in the distance in the time lapse. So one of the questions we are using the air to answer is how tornadoes form. And we want to do some evaluation of different theories of tornado genesis. Uh, one of these uh, that has been looked at with both the air and the Raxpole radar is how tornadoes form, whether it's in an upward fashion or a downward fashion. So uh, one of the th previous theories was that tornadoes uh, develop from rotational aloft and then they build downward to the ground. So one of the questions we want to answer is, is which one is it? Does a tornado form near the surface and go up or does it form aloft and, and build down? Uh, this is a sequence of images that are about one minute apart from each other. Uh, the green colors are winds coming toward the radar. The radar is located kind of off to the southeast of the image. 
uh, the yellow colors are winds coming out or going away from the radar. So the, the place where they're close together is the rotational couplet. Uh, you see here, there's a brief intensification of the winds that occur, then a brief weakening following by a, a significant intensification at the time where uh, the tornado forms. So one of the things we wanted to look at with this case, this is uh, work being led by uh, or, uh, Casey Griffin, who's now a professor at SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, this case was in Northwest Oklahoma, and we wanted to look at how this rotation evolves in time. So it's looking over about a five minute period, which is the whole time frame of one next rad scan, just for, for reference. And we also wanna look at it in height. So we're gonna look, look from zero kilometers up to four kilometers or from about zero to two and a half miles. So during this first period, the rotations, uh, the yellow colors here are the areas of stronger rotation. Uh, the rotations confined mainly to the lowest uh, half mile to a mile of the atmosphere. So uh, during this period, a tornado did not develop, uh, despite some rotation being present near the ground, there's relatively weak rotation aloft. Then during the second period, the rotation begins to weaken. So this rotation was not sustained for very long, maybe a minute and a half. And then when the tornado actually forms, it develops pretty rapidly in the lowest uh, two and a half kilometers or lowest mile and a half of the atmosphere. And then after uh, developing in this region, it develops in a, over a period of about a minute, uh, proceeding in upward fashion through the rest of the storm. Uh, so this contrasts previous theories about a tornado forming in descending manner. Uh, this is consistent with uh, some of the previous work that's been done with the OU RACS pull radar uh, by uh, Howie Bluestein's group. So one of the things that we also looked at with this case is uh, what is the difference between the period where rotation developed near the ground but didn't develop into a tornado and the period where rotation developed into a tornado. And the stars here show where the uh, locations of the, the vortex at different or at different heights. So the black lines, the lowest part of the atmosphere from zero to one kilometers. The red line is uh, the, the high, one of the higher altitudes that the air observed from two to three kilometers or about a mile and a half to two and a half miles above the ground. So during this early time, you can see uh, the tracks of the vortex, uh, the lowest level uh, here, the black line, it goes off to the south and then off to the west, whereas it just kind of goes off to the west and loops around at the top. So it's not very organized. The, the motions are quite a bit different. Uh, whereas during the tornado genesis period, uh, the, all these, the, the first time is here where the star is. And you can see at the time of tornado genesis denoted by these triangles, uh, everything's actually pretty well lined up and then proceeds along in a, a fairly synchronous manner off to the west at all the different heights. So it seems to be one of the factors that is uh, uh, perhaps sustaining the tornado genesis process. That's different from this early time where there was a little bit of rotation near the ground, but not sustained. Uh, another interesting observation uh, that we've seen is strong horizontal vortices. So one of the cool things about the air is it's getting this vertical snapshot all at the same time. So this is a, a cross-sectional view of the reflectivity or the power return to the radar. So the areas of uh, red colors are areas of heavier, where there's more precipitation or larger particles. And then looking at the Doppler velocities, uh, the interesting thing here that you can see, there's really strong winds here from the tornado, but just past that, there's this uh, a rotating feature in the horizontal. So here there's winds coming toward the radar and about one kilometer, there's winds coming away from the radar or moving away from the radar really quickly. Uh, so one of the things that's important about these horizontal vortices, uh, as I mentioned earlier, horizontal rotation is something that may be important for tornado genesis, but also may be important for sustaining a tornado. So we see this in very close proximity to the tornado. So one of the things that we're gonna look at in this case in the future is how that vortex, if it gets tilted up into the tornado somehow. So another question is how do tornadoes end? So we start with a tornado uh, here. This is a case in Northeast Texas. The tornado is relatively wide initially when we started observing it, it was producing strong wind speeds and then it uh, begins to weaken three minutes later and kind of going to what we call the rope phase where the funnel shrinks and the winds uh, weaken. This is an animation encompassing about five minutes but each uh, radar scan that you see here takes only five seconds. So you can see a lot of detail. Uh, starting at the earliest time, this tornado is really wide and then it starts to decay and it wraps around and it's barely distinguishable by the end of it. So you can see over five minutes, the tornado undergoes some pretty uh, dramatic transformation. 
during the there's basically a three stage process that we see during the the tornadoes uh, how the the dissipation phase or where the tornado is ending the first sign is that it's weakening at a height of around 1.5 uh, kilometers and it weakens in a downward fashion this is something that's also seen uh, with the ou rex pole radar one of the things that's uh, unique about this case that we observed is that the the tornado is weakening in a downward fashion as the vortex diameter is expanding so from a uh, a conservation of angular momentum uh, view. If you think about the uh, a figure skater, if they you've heard probably heard the analogy where they bring their arms in, they spin faster. The opposite's true here, where if, if they're spinning fast and they extend their arms out, they'll slow down. So here, the expansion of the of the tornado may be what's causing it to weaken as it's uh, in this downward manner. Uh, next, we see kind of a two-layer process where the tornado weakens faster. Uh, close to the ground than it does uh, just around the cloud base. And then the final period, the tornado weakens near the ground first and then proceeds upward uh, in a period of about 20 seconds or so. So we've uh, used the air to, to study tornadoes and we've gotten a lot of interesting data out of it. It was a prototype system, so we were, uh, we've been building a new phased array radars as a next generation to uh, uh, take over or, or uh, to uh, secede that radar. So the, the pair is one of these radars. It's polarimetric atmospheric imaging radar. It's an, a radar system that's funded by a National Science Foundation. And this system will be capable of five to 10 second uh, volumetric scanning, uh, similar to the air, but it offers a couple of unique capabilities. It'll be dual polarization, whereas the air was not. So this will give us the ability to categorize different precipitation types uh, for example, here on this plot on the in the bottom left corner, uh, this shows the distribution of small, large, and wet hail, or small, large, and giant hail. Uh, we'll also be able to see the three-dimensional distribution of tornado debris here in this image that's shown in some of these, uh, or the areas where there's the yellow colors. And uh, in a broad sense, this radar will be used for severe weather research, tropical cyclones, even studies of bird migration, all of which will benefit from uh, being able to scan really quickly. In addition to that, uh, the, uh, another radar that we're building is called Horus, and this is an effort funded by NOAA. And this is a, a test bed for an all, uh, that's a radar that's all digital, an all digital phased array system. So uh, a phased array radar is comprised of many small antennas. Uh, this radar will have uh, hundreds of antennas on it. And behind each of these antennas is essentially its own radar. So there's all the electronics of a radar system. So what that gives us is a tremendous amount of control of how we transmit and receive the data uh, coming in, uh, or transmit and receive weather data. So this provides an unflex unprecedented flexibility so that we can scan faster, we can get more accurate data. And uh, some of the images that are shown here, for example, if there's an area of heavy precipitation or a tornado is developing, we can prioritize that area over other areas that are less important so we can scan those areas faster. We can also transmit air style beams where we do this large transmit beam to cover a broad area and then form these narrow beams within that to uh, get fine detail. So one of the important questions we'll ask with this, uh, or answer with this, with this radar is with the future operational radar, uh, will we see some of these same signatures of tornado formation and dissipation? And this radar is at the same uh, frequency as NEXRAD. So it'll allow us to address some of those uh, questions. So the, the final topic I'm gonna discuss is uh, tornadoes and topography. And there's many myths about tornadoes and topography in cities. Uh, like tornadoes can't occur in mountainous areas or they don't uh, go through downtown areas. Uh, the reality is that's not really true that there are tor uh, pretty much all those uh, cases. There are cases of tornadoes and mountains cases of tornadoes in downtown areas. So uh, one example of this, there's a tornado, EF4 tornado documented by Ted Fujita, who's a, a very famous uh, tornado researcher in Yellowstone National Park. And the tornado actually goes over the continental divide. So uh, you could certainly get very significant tornadoes that occur in mountainous areas. Uh, tornadoes also occur in cities and downtown areas. This is a, a picture photo of a tornado in uh, near Salt Lake City. It's very close to some high-rise buildings in a downtown area. So one important point to make is that while no sur surface feature is going to keep a tornado from forming, 
the no surface feature is going to keep a tornado from potentially becoming violent and cause significant damage, they may affect the intensity of the tornado and even the frequency of tornado formation. Well, there have been some uh, recent studies that have done kind of climatological analysis and found that things like uh, the amount of vari uh, variations in terrain height can actually reduce uh, tornado frequency at least to some degree, uh, not, a, not a really substantial degree, but it can make it a little bit less likely. So why might uh, topography be important for tornadoes? So in a tornado, the inflow coming into it uh, comes in very close to the ground, maybe in the lowest 100 or 200 feet. So this, uh, the air that's coming close to the ground is interacting with the surface, there's a lot of friction. So the rotating air that the storm's providing that's flowing into the storm uh, is, interact, is intercountering friction. And if you have larger buildings or if you have trees, uh, more friction is present and that can slow the, the rotating air down more and perhaps weaken the tornado or cause other effects uh, that may impact the tornado or, or the, the rotating updraft of the storm. Uh, hills or valleys might also act to channel or deflect the winds. So if they may channel the winds in a certain way that the wind shear uh, or, or the environment of the storm becomes more favorable. So the wind shear, the way the winds change uh, might be enhanced if the winds are channeled in a certain way or they might be channeled in a way that makes it less favorable uh, for uh, tornadoes to form. So we're, we focused on looking at how tornadoes interact with different types of topography using computer simulations. That's work by one of my recent master students, Matt, Martin Satrio. Uh, simulations are here are, are producing a tornado that traverses over different types of terrain that we can basically input any kind of uh, terrain that we want into the simulation. So we've done a variety of different hills, valleys, ridges of different sizes. Uh, in this animation, you can see that a tornado is passing over a hill, and then it, or here it's starting to descend the hill. These arrows represent the winds in the tornado, so you can see them uh, circulating around uh, or going around in a, a counterclockwise fashion. Uh, these gray contours here are areas where the pressure is dropping most significantly, so uh, they're indicative of little mini tornadoes that rotate around the primary tornado that we call suction vortices. And these are responsible usually for some of the most intense winds and tornadoes. So you see as the tornado gets up at the top of the hill, these subvortices uh, tend to develop uh, and become really prominent. Also on the downhill side, uh, we see a large drop in pressure and the subvortices becoming more prevalent. So to look at some of these patterns, we did simulations of different heights of the hills. So here the, the top map shows along the tornado's track what the maximum wind speeds are. So the, the, blue, the blue and green colors show some of the weaker wind speeds. The yellow and the red colors show the strongest wind speeds that occurred. You can see some of these little mini, uh, mini tornadoes or sub vortices where the strongest winds were occurring. You can see some of these little circular paths uh, that are uh, areas where sub vortices had formed in the control simulation. Uh, as, you, as we go to the, this is the control simulations, the simulation where there's flat terrain everywhere and there is no hills or topography present. Uh, in the other cases, we looked at hills that are 25 meters tall, 50 meters or 100 meters. And you can see as, as you go up in height, you get more and more variability in the winds along the track of the tornado. And especially in the valley area, the winds become very intense. So uh, there's these pockets of really intense winds that aren't seen in the control simulation. Also on the tops of some of the hills, we get some in on, on the ascending portion, we sometimes see the development of these sub vortices where you see these curved paths of enhanced wind. Uh, another interesting simulation, we looked at a, a case of a tornado going through a valley. On um, the top part again is the flat terrain where there's no, no valley. The middle case is a valley that's about the width of the tornado. Uh, the tornado enters the valley and you can see the winds really intensify. Uh, one reason for this is that the, the valley can act to constrict the air within the tornado. And by conservation of angular momentum, it might lead to the, the winds speeding up as the tornado shrinks in size. Uh, also uh, looking at a case where the, the valley oscillated, uh, we see that the tornado winds actually follow the valley uh, up and down as this, so this kind of looks like maybe a river valley where the, the river valley kind of oscillates along a certain direction. So it's possible that tornadoes might 
if the if the path or if the valley or another feature um, has slight oscillations to it, the tornado might follow it. We did a case where the tornado followed in a valley and then the valley abruptly uh, veered off. In that case, the tornado did move out of the valley and didn't follow the, the path of the train. So subtle features that it may follow, but really abrupt ones, it, it's unlikely. As an animation, and you can see the tornado in the valley, here it's gonna start moving off to the north. And then it comes up to the north and then it'll start coming down toward the south. So it kind of hugs the south side of the, the valley in this case. So there are uh, a few things that we can take away when we I think look, take a look at all the different simulations we ran. We ran 30 different simulations with different heights of hills, valleys, ridges, and so forth. On the right, this is a plot where we've done it, where we normalized uh, the height. So that basically means that the highest point in all the simulations is given a value of one. The lowest point in all the simulations is given a value of zero. So whether the hill was 25 meters tall or 100 meters tall, the top of the hill is still one, the bottom of the hill is zero. So we want to see if the hilltops or the low-lying areas or in between experience the strongest winds. So these plots show the percent area of where there were winds exceeding EF2 and EF3 intensity. So the green curve shows EF2 intensity and the uh, yellow curve shows EF3 intensity. The, the strongest winds we found occurred in the lowest lying areas as well as on the hilltops. And we could see that in some of those animations where the subvortices were forming, producing some of the more uh, enhanced winds in the tornado. So sometimes a, a small amount of terrain can lead to, a, one of the other findings is that a small amount of terrain might lead to a stronger tornado, at least in some locations, whereas uh, taller terrain tended to be more disruptive and, and weaken the tornado. So if you put really tall, tall hills into the simulation, the effects can be disruptive, and a lot of times it'll disrupt the alignment between the tornado and the storm's updraft. A recent project that we started was modeling uh, residential structures and how they're affected by tornadoes, but also taking into account how the buildings themselves interact with the flow of the tornado. So these little white dots here uh, show the locations of the or of the uh, individual residences that are uh, 15 by 15 meters. So they're about the same size as a typical, typical house. Uh, some of the interesting things here, we do see some areas where the winds are really enhanced within the streets. Now you can also see that here, this is the west east component of the wind. So here winds are moving really strong toward the center of the tornado. And here they're moving really fast toward the center of the tornado from east to west. In this case, they're moving really strong from north to south. You can see in these blue colors here is where some of the strongest winds are between the gaps in the buildings. You'd also see that here in the maximum horizontal velocities along the track of the tornado. Uh, some of the gaps have some really strong winds. Uh, there's a little bit of evidence of this in areas where there's cul-de-sacs. There's a couple of things that are going on here. Uh, one could be the channeling of the winds in this direction aimed toward this building uh, that could lead to a more significant damage uh, if the winds are channeled and increase in speed. You can see the buildings next to it are all intact, whereas the house at the end of the cul-de-sac is completely gone. Uh, the other factor is that the garage is usually at the or facing the wind in this case. So this is the primary wind direction. And when the garage door uh, gets damaged, it cre increases a lot of, creates a lot of internal pressure in the house that can lead to kind of a cascading effect of significant damage to the structure. Whereas these houses, the, the winds were not aimed at the garage door. So it's likely that uh, they sustained less damage uh, as a result of that. Uh, another thing that we started doing just uh, recently is uh, looking at some large buildings. This is a tornado going through a downtown area. So you see the tornado doesn't disappear. Uh, but the tornado undergoes quite a bit of interaction with the area. So you can see it kind of actually leans in toward the downtown area as it comes in and becomes very turbulent. Um, with, so there's quite a bit of variety in the pressure or the, the shape of the condensation funnel, which represents the pressure in the tornado, as well as the wind speeds that, are, that occur in the downtown area. So this is something we're gonna be looking at more in the future, but I just wanted to show an animation of it because it's pretty neat. So in summary, the, the Advanced Radar Research Center is uh, pioneering a lot of new radar technology with the goal to improve our understanding of tornadoes as well as forecasting tornadoes in the future with new, te with new technology. 
uh, the hemispheric imaging radar is a, a phased array system that we used uh, to study tornado formation and dissipation, uh, finding that tornadoes formed in an upward manner, uh, in particular when the vortex uh, became aligned in the lower part of the atmosphere, and that alignment persists with time. A tornado dissipation also occurs in a, a three-step process, where initially the, the tornado weakens in mid-levels and proceeds downward, but then at the, the very conclusion of the tornado, the dissipates from the ground up. Uh, computer simulations also have shown that topography in buildings can affect the winds and tornadoes. So there's something that need to be accounted for in, in structural engineering studies where we're trying to understand what the variability of winds are that tornadoes produce. Uh, the strongest winds tend to occur in low-lying areas, but also on hilltops. Uh, residential buildings and large high-rises also can introduce large variability in the winds, increasing the winds in some areas, directing the winds in certain directions. So if you'd like to learn more about the ARC, you can follow us on uh, Twitter or Facebook, and we tend to post a lot of interesting things on there from time to time. So okay, thank you. I'll take any questions that you have. OK, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, for all the participants, there's a QA and a uh, icon at the bottom of the screen, and you can submit any uh, questions there. And then David will read, read them aloud and then answer them. So while they're coming in, I don't know if you mentioned it, but some of the new radars, um, what's the timeline on those? That's what people typically would ask. So the radars are, are currently under development. Uh, they're expected um, to be finished kind of in the complete in the stages of completion late in 2021 with uh, kind of the first field tests and data collection in 2022. Yeah, so actually, both, uh, both Aaron Horace. Is that, Bob, that is accurate, right? Yeah, the uh, 2021 uh, t late 2021 for Horace and early 2022 for uh, field field studies. And I asked that question actually, or something <laughs> very similar. David, we have a couple of questions in the question and answer box now. Um, when will pair data be available? Uh, so the it right, goes along the, the same lines as the, the previous question with. Uh, It'll be, uh, data should be available sometime in, in 2022, or at least some preliminary data from kind of the first operations uh, that we have with the radar system. Um, the next question says, hi, David, great talk on your air slides uh, or one of the radars. You had giant, large, and small hail discriminated. What did you use to make those classifications? Uh, this was a, a work done by uh, one of my master students, uh, Clary uh, Satrio. She, uh, used an algorithm that was developed uh, by the National Severe Storms Lab by Alexander Richkoff and his collaborators uh, that characterize, uh, they used uh, dual polarization data to identify areas where you have small, large, and giant hail. And they've done some validation by uh, going out in the field and seeing where a large, large hail was, large hail and small hail was uh, to improve that classification. So it'll certainly be something that'd be interesting to look at with a mobile system as well. Next question, any thoughts or plans on doing joint studies with Pear and or Horus with ATD? Uh, yes, uh, as, uh, for both of these radars, we, we plan to work closely with the National Severe Storms Lab and the efforts there with the ATD, which is the Advanced Technology Demonstrator, uh, which is a radar that's uh, NSSL is currently operating and providing data to forecasters as a way to also uh, explore some of these different avenues for a future next replacement of the operational radar system. So yeah, that is something we're, we're very interested in doing. Next question, um, has radar development been consistent through history or does it tend to occur in bursts? That's a, that is a really good question. I think it, to some degree, it tends to occur in bursts where you have a really significant breakthrough. I think it also occurs in bursts in the sense that uh, there's a lot of technology and meteorology that gets adopted from other innovations in radar, from other kind of subfields of, of radar. A lot of uh, aviation radar, for example, uh, has contributed to a lot of our development. Things like phased array are not really new to 
weather radar, but they're just now being adopted in the last 10 or 20 years. So I would say a thing like phased array, for example, is really rapidly uh, increasing in meteorology, whereas scan speeds were very uh, slow to improve for quite a while before that. So I would say it, it tends to occur in burst uh, when we're able to bring in some sort of new innovation, but then we continually gain new, uh, new innovations after that. Uh, next question, it's from Megan Baumgars, and she said, great presentation. How do you decide what storm to go to if there are multiple storms? If you send people to similar storms in different areas of the state or outside Oklahoma, how do you decide what radar truck to send to each storm system? Well, usually uh, each of the radar trucks will have uh, kind of a defined mission uh, where the, the radar will have a specific task in mind, and they'll usually be a lead scientist with that radar system. So they'll be uh, kind of uh, doing the forecast to determine where the most favorable area is for uh, tornadoes or any type of weather that they might be uh, trying to target with the mobile radar. So throughout the day, we'll uh, kind of refine that forecast and uh, move, drive around to different locations. Uh, occasionally you drive around in a circle uh, if the forecast is uh, constantly changing. But usually uh, we'll end up in a, an area and end up kind of just sitting there for a while until storms develop and then pick a storm to target. That's the end of the questions that have been submitted so far. Anybody has any more? Oh, another one just popped up. Do you think the changes in tornado intensity based on cities and elevation changes you're seeing are com uh, comparable to internal tornado intensity variability, changes in intensity caused by the storm slash environment? Yeah, I, I, I do think at least in some cases, um, the, the changes in the storm like throughout its lifetime can be pretty dramatic. But at least on short time scales, um, some of the changes can be almost uh, the equivalent of like a, a change in the EF scale from like an EF3 to an EF4 or an EF2 to an EF3. So those changes uh, are certainly comparable to some of the storm scale uh, or some of the changes in the storm that are ongoing that also modulate the intensity of the tornado. So it certainly seems like uh, they can be comparable. Uh, one of the tricky things is they occur really fast. And they're also uh, pretty hard to discern sometimes from, if you're taking a radar out, it'd be hard to discern, is it caused by the train or is it caused by something going on in the storm? So that's kind of an ongoing area of research to try and see if we can disentangle those two things from each other, where did the storm cause the tornado to intensify or was it you know, the hill that it passed over? You want to have any more questions for David? I have one. Um, so what do you think is after phased array weather radar? Well, one of the, I think one of the really exciting technologies that's emerging right now um, is uh, called bi-static radar or passive radar. And this is a, a something we've been developing in the radar group here uh, work uh, by uh, one of the PhD students who just graduated, Andrew Bird. And the cool thing about this is that these radars don't actually transmit anything, but they receive data from other radars and they get a different look at the winds. So you can, if you have multiple of these, you can get an idea of what the wind structure is in the storm in a much better way than you can with just one radar alone. And these are very low cost. They cost, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a piece. Whereas a radar system, other radar system itself, you know, costs about some order of a million dollars. So I, I think in the future, especially pairing that with phased array, you'll be able to get rapid scan data to see both the horizontal and the vertical winds in a storm and be able to have many of these uh, little radars around. We have another question that was submitted. Um, is the imaging technique purely for research? Could operational radars benefit from its rapid scan capability? There are certainly situations where I, I think the imaging technique could be beneficial for operational radars. There are some disadvantages to imaging. Uh, that one of the disadvantages is that uh, it doesn't uh, perfectly control or eliminate the data coming from other areas within that large beam. So you can get some, effect, some contrib contributions from data higher on the storm that affect the area that you're trying to look at. So there may be situations where uh, especially like for precipitation estimation where it may not uh, work as well. 
But in cases of where you're looking at tornado formation, you really want fast, uh, uh, really rapid observations in a column. Um, I think imaging could be a really nice solution uh, for that. And there's different degrees to which you can use imaging as well. You don't have to form really large beam like the air, you could do a slightly smaller one and uh, get a little bit higher data quality. That's all the questions we have right now, unless anybody is typing up there. So let's give them a moment just in case. Okay. How do we best bridge the gap between uh, the, torna the tornado scale simulations and the storm scale simulations observations of tornadoes using radars? Well, one of the things that certainly helped uh, uh, storm scale simulations continue to get higher and higher resolution. Um, many of the simulations that are being done uh, by the CAPS group here at OU, as well as uh, Lee Orff at the University of Wisconsin, are now getting down to the resolution that's close, uh, if not tornado scale. Um, those are still very, they require a lot of uh, computation time to run. But I, I think over the next 10 years, you'll see those simulations become realistic enough that we can really compare them in a very high fidelity way to observations from radars of tornadoes. Uh, and I, I, my guess is that that will probably be how that, that gap is bridged. Uh, at least in the meantime, uh, we can still uh, take data from uh, the storm scale data. We can use some of these high resolution models. Uh, we can use the data from the, the large scale and apply that to the, the smaller scale radar when we run the simulations or the smaller scale simulation domain and do a uh, do some simulations that take advantage of the small domain to get fine detail in the tornado. How likely is it that uh, data from these new radar technologies would be made publicly available? Uh, for example, the Mesonet's website? So we, we do have our data, they go live to the, the ARCS webpage. Um, so the right now the RAX poll and PX1000 um, and then the PX10000 when, when it starts operating, those data go live to our website. So I, I envision we'll do the same thing for both Pear and Horus. Um, so the, the data will be um, all are also, if you contact us, we can provide data to you. Um, we have an open data policy. So if, if somebody wants to collaborate with us or uh, just wants to look at the data, uh, they can just send us an email. Uh, eventually, in the in the near term, we also plan on generating some repositories that are accessible, where you can click on links and download data and can take a look at it from interesting cases. So, once these radar new radars are online and available, the data will be accessible through our website, and we'll have links up to those. I'm not seeing any more questions pop up right now. Okay, that may be it. Yep. Okay. Call it. Okay, so David, thanks again. Uh, great hey. talk. Oh, yeah, we got a question saying thank you. So, <laughs> hey. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, great job, man. Yeah, thank you so much, David, for your time, and you too, Bob. Okay. Hey, Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye.